Greetings all and welcome to another session here of Tuesday Talks. Today we're going to be continuing a discussion in English grammar. In particular, we're going to be looking at the tense aspect modality system. And uh, we're not going to just be looking at the system theoretically. We've done that before in another video. You may want to go look at that. But today we're going to be looking at it in the context of using it in actual discourse in oral and written discourse. So let's just jump into this right now and we'll take a look at some of the components that are involved and how they're actually used in uh, actual conversation, in actual discourse. Question. How are tense and aspect used in language? Uh, and again, in the English language, there are only two tenses, past and present, and all the other things that you add on to it are the different aspects. And that's how we get the variety of quote-unquote times involved in language. Now, the interesting thing about this is that users will systematically jump from tense to tense or time to time. You know, remember, there's only two tenses. But they do it in a systematic way. They do it in a predictable way that you can notice and measure. Uh, for example, someone might say, you know, I have a headache and I have had it for two hours. So I'm going to take an aspirin. Now, within this one example here, we have present, past perfect, and then future. We have three different times that are going on here, and we jump between them rather easily, but it is in a predictable way. And so the real question here is, how do we get this idea, this information, into the minds of our second language learners? To master this level of language, a second language learner needs to understand things above the sentence level. They need to understand the interactions between these times and also the standard patterns that are used to convey certain ideas. All right, having a referential understanding uh, better helps them understand the intended meanings. And by referential understanding is where they're coming from, where the author or the sender of the message is in their mind. Uh, where they're beginning. Are they beginning in the past or in the present or in the future? Are they speaking of the past as if it's in the past or if it, as if it's in now? You know, they're living in the past in their mind and it's a now event. Uh, anyway, they, they need to understand the different references that they're in. Of course, the real question for those who are looking at the video here is how do TESOLers, how do TESOL teachers teach this kind of stuff to their students so their students can use it. Now, uh, Cels Marcia, uh, Larson Freeman here when in their the grammar book uh, describe a variety of historical uh, research related to the tense aspect modality system and how it can be helpful for us to understand it uh, for the English language. For example, uh, William Bill in the 1960s developed a framework to try to understand and describe the interaction of tense and aspect within the Spanish language. And uh, Larson Freeman, uh, Celso Mercia here, they decided, you know, this might be good stuff for us to use in trying to understand the interactions in English. And uh, so they decided to look at some of the components in the Bull framework. Um, just as in uh, English, there is past perfect, present perfect, future perfect. Uh, and then, of course, press, present, and future. And there are these four, or in this case, eight different time uh, components that are going on here. And native speakers, what do they do? They intermingle these. They enter not all of them, but a variety of these aspects when they're communicating, just like the previous example. So, for example, would you like to join us for dinner? Would you like, right? Will you? No, thanks. I already ate. Or, no, thanks. I have already eaten. And then, of course, you ask the question, well, what's the difference between these two, and how do you explain that difference? And is there a particular uh, model that these components fall into? Uh, normally, when they're talking about a framework, they'll have a sentence, and they'll ask you to drop something into the sentence. Okay, What's the tense that you're going to drop in? What type of verb are you going to be dropping into that segment? Uh, and so with the bull framework, um, he figured out that there are future, past, and present uh, uh, frameworks or axes in which uh, time, uh, timed or, or the different aspects of the verb are, are dropped in. So, for example, uh, a time before axis, right? By the time he will have arrived. 
Okay, so that's a time before a time. Um, and then uh, a time before a time in the present would be, see, he has lived. Or if it's in the past, he had eaten. Um, and this is time before time. That's the axis. That's the idea here, a time before time. Now, bear in mind, this whole idea, time before time, doesn't necessarily exist in every language. Uh, as far as having a specific setup, a specific way of explaining it uh, grammatically, lexically, within, within, the, within the, uh, the tense modality system. They figure out some other way to do it, but it's not built into the tense um, aspect modality system. Uh, another type of access is for events, uh, is for the actual event, right? Um, for example, he will go to the park. He is going. This is the is or be. Uh, here is this idea of uh, planned in the past and due in the future, right? Um, another one would be a uh, habitual, right? She sings every morning in the shower, okay? That's, a, that's an event. That's a time for the particular event, and that's another access, uh, access where you can drop in a particular time, but it's a predictable one that you put in. Or if it's in the past, she drove me to the game. Here is just a straight past because it's just a straight uh, fact of something that's done in the past. It's not a time before a time or in the next case here, a time after axis. After he finishes, he is, he will go, right? He will come and then later is your cue, right? It's a time after a time. Okay, and then if it's in the past, but it's a time after a past time, after he won, he went. Okay, so we've got two different times here. So in the English language, you can play with all these different tenses, but they go into some sort of predictable order, a predictable time slot. You don't mix, you know, this one here over here with this one here and get something that's done. Now, it's technically or theoretically it can be done, but the natural use of them, which is really the question here is, which ones do we often use? Which ones do we often play with uh, together? That's the real key. How do we do that? How do we set that up? And more importantly, how do we teach our students to understand what they are? Some other uh, research uh, that they had done, one is with uh, Chaff or Chafee, I don't know how it's pronounced, um, but his research concluded that tenses must be maintained unless they're generic or unless there is a new time marker introduced. Now, uh, when they talk about generic, they're talking about something that what I would call timeless. Um, like the example before, she sings every morning. Well, that's a timeless. It's every single morning. It's not past. It's not present. It's not future. It's an habitual thing. Or generic could be uh, something that is simply a state of fact. Two plus two is four. Uh, water is wet, and the verb there now is is, and because it's generic, okay? According to Chaff or Chafee, uh, tenses are going to be maintained, right, unless they're generic or unless there is a new time marker. So if I'm speaking in the now, well, that's going to be one thing. But if I say, if I start talking about an event that happened in the past, well, that's a change in the marker, okay? I went, I wanted to go, but I saw... Okay, it's a change in the marker, so I'm going to change the tense. That's a good thing to understand, that we keep in that same tense normally unless there is some time event change that is introduced into the, the dialogue or the discussion. Labov talks about these six uh, narrative parts, and depending on which type of narrative you're dealing with, whether it's an abstraction, uh, and abstractions are generally timeless, um, whether it's an orientation or an, uh, an evaluation or an action or a coda, any of these will be able to change the possible narrative or limit the narrative, uh, the, the tense aspect that's going on. There are other components uh, that should be understood for the meaning to be clear. One is, for example, is, is the historical present. In other words, using the present tense for past events. Um, so when you're talking about Lincoln and uh, the things that he did, you may refer to it in the present tense, okay? Now, Lincoln, he, he makes his declaration, and then he goes, to, uh, he goes to Virginia, okay? Now, these are all things that obviously have happened in the past, but I'm referring to them as if they're happening now, 
because that's the in my mind I'm actually at the event I'm actually with that time frame so I I speak in the present even though it's an actually a past event and that's another type of way that language can be used these the tense and the aspects can be used even though I'm speaking of them in the present they actually happen in the past and then there's uh, my uh, research uh, conclusions and these are uh, basically that to understand what the reader is actually trying to say I need to understand his starting point or his current mental location. If we go back here and look to this whole idea of uh, the present tense uh, for past or historical events, I need to understand where the reader is beginning, what their orientation is. If they are imagining that they are at the event, that they are uh, part of that time frame, well, they're going to use the present tense even though it was a past event. I could do the same thing for the future, okay? So the important thing is to understand where the, the, uh, the, the sender, okay, where the producer of language is in their mind to understand uh, what it is that they're trying to say. Um, okay. Uh, there was also uh, other work that they had looked at, and that's uh, with regard to uh, Sue or Shu, and again, I don't understand how to pronounce this gentleman's name, but uh, this is his framework. And one of the things he concluded is that native speakers use one tense aspect frame modality to generally introduce a topic. And then they switch to another topic to elaborate on it. Um, so uh, they're in, they give a variety of, ex of examples where you'll begin a story, you know, I had been to the movies. Oh, I had seen that before. Okay, and I'm using past perfect there, but then I go into the past. Yeah, oh yeah, I liked the movie. I remember I saw this, or I was seeing this, and I changed tenses. I use one for introductions, okay, present perfect, past perfect, and then I use a different one for uh, explaining or elaborating. And that's another frame that you can test and set up, and that's what they've done, and they see that there are these predictable patterns. You can also look at uh, modals, uh, the specific modals of will and be going to, and that there are some differences with them. So, for example, will uh, oftentimes refers to willingness, right? Someone knocks at the door and you say, I'll get it. You don't normally say, I'm going to get it. Um, that's something that means something different. So uh, you see there's a, a difference because of the use of them and how they're uh, typically set up. Now, be going to is oftentimes has to do with pre-planning. Um, you know, I've planned something in the past and I will complete that task in the future, right? I'm going to the movies. Well, I plan to do it in the past and I will do it in the future. I'm going to the movies, right? Um, so, be, will and be going to, although they generally mean future, they're actually different in the way they describe future. Again, this is these frameworks, again, that we're looking at, right? Um, there are also the use of things like uh, uh, would and used to, right? Um, on habitual past, it's going to be used to, right? I used to uh, play baseball, right? Uh, and then you could say, I played baseball. Well, it mean, they're different, actually, in meaning. They're both in the past. They both describe a past event, but they're different in how that past event is described. And lastly, uh, the, uh, uh, the present perfect is used for clarification uh, in uh, interactive settings. As I tried to just say before, where you use it once and then you change uh, that aspect later on to go into the straight past to describe something, right? Um, so we use these tense and aspects differently for a variety of things. And some of them, we have patterns in how we use them. And that's the important thing, is that we have these different patterns. And the question now becomes, as we learn these patterns, we need to figure out how we can teach them to our students. Uh, tense aspect modality can only really be grasped when we consider their discourse pragmatic and inter interactional features as well as their formal and semantic features. Um, we, native English speakers, do this without thinking. 
um, second language learners are going to have a little more difficulty and so we need to try to help them understand what these differences are. Here's a big problem though. The, and this is out of uh, Larson Freeman uh, Sells Mercy's book, uh, The Grammar Book, right? They, they say, quote, the discourse convention of a learner's native language tense aspect modality system, their tense aspect modality system will most likely not transfer into English. So the patterns that they have learned in their language will probably not transfer directly into English which means these things need to be taught to them directly. They're going to be things that are going to be harder for them to understand because they're probably not the same. They probably don't use the same uh, tense or aspects that we do to describe the same types of time conventions. Um, that's all I have for this particular uh, podcast. If you do have any questions, you can certainly jump by and drop a message uh, or you can uh, send me an email. I do want to thank you for stopping by, and I hope to see you again.